empowered people make informed decisions that lead to living a life without regret. This is Sarah Kaki and Shauna Woods from Atlanta Divorce Law Group, and this is the Happily Ever After Divorce Podcast. All right, Shauna, today I want us to talk about the uncomfortable words we try to hide from, run from, and what we're going to specifically talk about, come up with other words for so we don't have to say the big ugly divorce word or there's many other words that we avoid saying by coming up with a nickname for them, sometimes a cute nickname. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about. I think as a single person, a lot of times we do come up with words to say, I'm single, when you can just say it, I'm single. What's your What's your favorite word that people use as a nickname instead of saying, I'm single? I don't know if it's my favorite or if it's my least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> my least favorite is I'm dating myself. I'm dating oh, myself on dates. And it just kind of always makes me laugh because I'm like, well, first of all, who's paying? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what kind of euphemism is this that you're taking yourself on dates? But I think the reason it does bother me is why can't you just say, I'm enjoying my time. I'm learning about myself and I'm going places. I hang out with friends or family or I'm going places. But it kind of puts you in this kind of pigeonhole of society must think I'm dating or society demands I be dating someone. Yeah. Therefore, I must say I'm dating myself. Just simply say, I'm not dating. So the interesting conversation that leads to this topic of the uncomfortable words we dance around with cute little nicknames like I'm dating myself or the other ones we had thought of leading up to this conversation. We're like, man, we need to record this is the famous, the conscience uncoupling. It's a mouthful for me. Or the new one that came out when (laughs) Jada Pinkett Smith wanted to say she's having an affair. She instead, or it was having an affair. She instead said, I was in an entanglement, which all of it is gossip if you look at it from just a celebrity standpoint. But the standpoint you and I were interested in is why do we have a need? Because it's not just with the celebrities that just make these things popular. But why do we have a need as a society to not call things by their actual name to avoid any discomfort that comes along with them? Yeah, and we do have that need. Uh, and I think it, it's a very um, common need. And we look at it to celebrities when they say it, we're like, oh, yeah, I want to say that too, because they're in the public eye. Right. right. And so they do kind of set a precedent of, oh, I can say this. And they create word. culture with it. Exactly. I think it's a very cute and funny, you know, uh, euphemism to say entanglement when it was like, no, really, it was an affair. And I think one of the things that, you know, I was thinking about with these uncomfortable words, it's people don't want to sit in the uncomfort of the words, right? And so they make these bubbles around them so they don't have to feel that uncomfort. And sometimes it's important to feel that uncomfort and say, I had an affair. Yeah. Like, that's a big one. Yeah. Right? And to, and I'm not going to say she was trivializing because I don't know her. I'm not making that judgment. But to sometimes use these words that you think trivializes what the real occurrence was. And I, and I love that perspective of sitting in the uncomfort of it or the discomfort of what happened. Because in, from my perspective and my own personal development and everything we've seen with our clients, there cannot be actual growth past a painful point in your life until you can actually face the truth of the where you are in now. Mm-hmm. You can't talk about where you want to go and you can't even start making a plan for where you want to go until you take full responsibility for where you are in now. And, and I don't mean this is a rhetorical question, but can we actually take full responsibility for an affair if we call it an entanglement? Can we take full responsibility for a marriage leading to a divorce, if we call it a conscious uncoupling, can we, right? right? Can we take full responsibility for the fact that we are single, but don't want to be, if we call it, I'm dating myself? Because that's what I'm hearing. Right. No, I and I agree with you there. Maybe that is the distinction, is when people say, I'm dating myself, what they really want to be is dating someone else. Right. Right. They want that 
that um, I was going to say entanglement. That's not the right <laughs> word. <laughs> they want the the coupleness. They they do want to be in 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 a relationship, and I think it's easier to say I'm dating myself than to say I'm lonely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I agree with you. I I I don't think that you know I'm not the expert, but and I don't think people can take responsibility until they say the words to themselves, mm-hmm. acknowledge what happened and say, how do I move past that? So the one of the big lessons I learned while I was studying child custody issues and also violence against children mm-hmm. in law school is uh, we, there was a study and I don't have it to quote to, or offer it to anybody, but I can just say that I had read that when we don't teach young children to call their body parts by the correct name, they actually have a higher tendency of not coming forward in case they are ever improperly touched or molested. Mm -hmm. And these studies had shown that children who learn to say my vagina or my penis Mm -hmm. and didn't feel any sort of discomfort with saying it and didn't come up with other cute words to call call their private parts, uh-huh. which by the way, in my family we did. <laughs> you know, the vagina <laughs> was too. the vagina was your flower. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> oh, it was. Yes, um, we had very cute names for body parts. Those children are actually more likely to come forward and say, "Mom and Dad, you know, so and so touched my penis or touched my vagina." Uh-huh. And I'm bringing that up to say, is that does that psychology play a part in this where? If we are not able to face a hurt, we're not able to seek the help we really need when we're masking Uh what we're going through with trying to attach a cute word to it. Now, obviously, to the single people out there who are loving the single life and loving being on their own and they don't fall. I don't think they would take any offense to us saying, hey, calling it dating yourself is a cute way to say it. But I think for those who are don't want to be single or don't want to be divorced uh-huh. or don't want to say that they ever had an affair. Is this the healthy way to deal with it is to come up with a cute word or a cute phrase that our culture has kind of given them an out on. I don't think it's healthy, but it's interesting. I've read that same um, study that you were talking about. And one of the things they brought out is because if you put a cute name mm-hmm. on a body part, it's as if you're shaming the real name. It's right. as if you, you're you saying, you can't say that. And so with the children, what that's teaching them, if I'm remembering the study correctly, is that um, it's shameful to talk about these things. So they do feel shame if something happens and they don't want to talk about it to their parents. I think the same kind of thing does translate here. You know, people feel shame saying, I'm going through a divorce or I want a divorce. Instead, they say, I'm uncoupling. Yes. All right. To me, it's like a train that is taking off in two different directions. I'm like, what does that mean? You know, right. We're uncoupling. You know, the the word divorce has a certain meaning, and I think that you know, dealing with what that means to yourself and dealing with what society says is part of the process Absolutely. to getting through to being a healthier and happier you. Absolutely. That was so well articulated and I and so why does this matter why everything Shauna just said is the reason it matters our whole mission of happily ever after divorce in Atlanta divorce law group is on a mission to remove the stigma of divorce but we're pretty particular about how we believe that stigma of divorce is removed and that's through self work Mm -hmm. by clearing your conscience that you did everything you could before Mm -hmm. you had to make the other choice, the choice of, man, I did everything I could before I chose to get divorced, right? And once you do, then your conscience is clear and you can live a life without regret. And not until more people are able to live a life without regret are we able to actually change the stigma of divorce. Mm -hmm. I personally don't believe the stigma of divorce is gonna change by all of us coming together as a society and saying, okay, one, two, three, Done. No more stigma on divorce. I think it's magic wand. Out. Magic wand. You're all, you know, healed from this. I think it happens by more and more people living a life of example, uh-huh. and that's sort of what you know 
you and I have partnered up on this mission for Atlanta Divorce Law Group with Happily Ever After Divorce is creating more, helping more people create that example. So going back to this conscious uncoupling, <laughs> I read the quite a bit about it and um, the people who I'm going to have to credit that came up with the concept of Dr. Habib Sadiri and Dr. Sherry Sami. And I believe they have a book. They become The concept has become very popular by Gwyneth Paltrow and her celebrity divorce to the lead singer of Coldplay. And what, this is so fascinating, Shauna. What they say about conscious uncoupling is the same mission of our happily ever after divorce. They're talking about removing the stigma of divorce. Mm-hmm. They're talking about creating a more wholesome concept for the family, for restructuring the idea of the family, which is literally words out of mind and your hearts of like, can we just reframe the idea of what the family is so we can keep being a family after the mm-hmm. fact? But they write all of this about the healing process after divorce, healing society and the stigma of divorce, creating a different framework. But then they end the concept with, okay, this will be done by slapping another name on it. Instead of divorce, let's call it conscience uncoupling, where we're not fighting each other, but where we're changing the whole framework. Again, not a rhetorical question. Do you think This is the way the stigma of divorce could change. It's just for us to change the name of divorce to something completely different. You know, I think that's very fascinating because as you were talking, I'm thinking about some other concepts where people have taken ownership of certain names and said, no, I'm going to own this and this is going to be good for me and say, "I'm, I'm here. But I'm also thinking about another situation in which people who have been victims either of sexual abuse right. or of, of domestic violence, which we often run into, and they don't say, I'm a victim. They say, I'm a survivor, mm-hmm. right? And what that does for them does not take away everything they went through and does not take away the fact that there was a perpetrator and a victim, but it makes them feel stronger in saying, okay, I'm going to take this other word and now apply it to me because I don't like the idea of being a victim. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. And I like the idea of what they're saying. Obviously it's what you and I really believe in and why we did partner up in, in, in our group so questions that I don't know the answer to that. You know, I do think that there are times when you should have ownership and say, I, for instance, I'll take the entanglement. Yeah. I think that's too cutesy for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but and, and honestly, I'm not having judgment over anyone having an affair because there are so many different factors that go into people's choice to step outside of marriage that are played on by both parties and I'm not blaming anyone, but I think when you do that, you know, and you make that choice, it's not an accident, folks. When you make that choice, you do have to have the ownership in saying, I have to own this. Yes. Right. I I have to say, I did this and make sure that if you don't want it to happen again, how did you get there? Right. And sit again in that uncomfortable spot as far as taking a word and changing it so that you feel empowered, I guess is a good word, mm-hmm. then is a cutesy conscious uncoupling okay? Or is the fact that the word divorce had such a connotation that we really want to break through? Because it's not, when you say, I went through a divorce, it's not like you said, I had a victimhood. You know, who knows what happened in a right. divorce? But just because you have a divorce, I don't think it's the same thing. And I'm just talking through this as we're working. I mean, there's no real, there's no right or wrong with this. I think it's definitely a personal journey. And obviously neither Shauna and I are psychologists or therapists, but we have some life experiences of our own and met and worked with a lot of different clients and seen what has worked and what hasn't worked. But we're both very committed to continuously educating ourselves on how can more people empower themselves so that they don't take one incident in life and have it ruin the rest of their life. If anything, any of these incidences in life where you're like, that's not how I plan for that to grow to go is an opportunity for that pain to turn into power. But my feeling on it is. If it was just a personal decision for me, Sarah Khaki, 
I would want to actually face that word divorce and with all of its stigma and all the glory of that stigma face on because it would feel more empowering to say in I was able to deal with this stigma and I found the tools within to deal with it. Not a tool that relied on society changing the name of this or not a tool that required me to go around and say, let me educate everybody on my conscience uncoupling so that I can be comfortable with my conscience uncoupling, right? And that's really just a personal value system that I think we all have to look at. And some people will say, no, I actually need that word. I need to hang on to that word. You know, it's, it makes me think of Romeo and Juliet and Shakespeare. It's like, what's in a name? You know, and it's like, what is in a name? Right. What's in, what is the power of a word? And for some, it, it maybe has that stigma is almost like, I need, I need to hang on to this, like to your point to empower myself. But to me, your most painful moment can be your most powerful moment. And have you sort of reduced the pain by calling it something else, a pain that has potential to be serve as greatness for you? Pain that you can say after this, man, I'm more secure in myself than ever. I'm feeling more confident in myself and I don't have to rely on other people's perception of things in order for me to be comfortable. But to play devil's advocate again, do you think, as far as a society goes, these words help society as whole to remove their feelings towards these things? Well, like you said, I'm not a psychologist. Although practicing family law for about 19 years, I kind of feel like one by <laughs> yeah, now. Sure. I think that the that when we say, honestly, when you first came up with the concept and you told me about um, what is it, conscious uncoupling. It's a mouthful. It yes. is a mouthful. I didn't even know what you were talking about. I really had no idea. I was like, what, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I, and so I don't think it helps society heal or take away the stigma of the word divorce. If we don't even know what you're talking about when you say it. Right. And hopefully I think that we're headed towards a society where divorce it does not have the stigma that it used to. It certainly doesn't have the stigma that it did at least 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? There was a lot fewer divorces. But I do think the word divorce in itself has this connotation we would like to see kind of taken away mm -hmm. is that the, the when you say I have been divorced, I've been through a divorce, I'm going through a divorce, people don't look at you as less than, like you failed at something, right? This is just a a part of life that you've had to deal with, right? right. And so to to be the opposite of that, I really do feel that, you know, going through whatever your your own personal life, you know, and if you need to say a cutesy word to get you to a place, that's between you and your therapist right. and your conscious. For me, when I have to deal with something painful, I like to look at it, I like to name it, mm -hmm. and I like to deal with it. And that's the only way I process things. And I encourage other people to process the way they want to <laughs> and what's good for them. But looking at it from society, I really think we should say it, you know, take the power away from work. You're right. Right. Was it Harry Potter and Voldemort? Yes. <laughs> right? the, the person we shall not name. The, the thing that we, we shall, shall not name. It was, there's a, one song, it's called, I'm going through the big D, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean Dallas. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, it's that, that divorce word that even in songs people want to say because it had such a, a negative connotation. But I do think now, you know, as society has changed and have women have really been able to support themselves, we did see a lot more divorces right. as people were able to live outside that kind of traditional family unit. So to answer your question, it's very long winded. No, I think we need to deal with the word divorce. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about the children of couples who you know, decide to sit their children down. And, and typically they sit down and would say, mom and dad are getting a divorce. Right. So what does that look like? 
That's very interesting. You just said that reminded me of in Sarah knows that I, I watch a lot of, or listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. And there's this one where a guy comes in and he says, when I have to tell people that their family member died, he says, you have to say the word died. Yeah. You cannot say they passed. They cannot say they moved on. They cannot say they're no longer here because the person's so in shock. They don't understand what you're right. telling them. Probably the same kind of concept if we're talking about with children. You need to say the word so that they can understand exactly what is happening. I, I completely agree with that. And I think also it's, you know, I immigrated as a child, as a refugee. And I'm trying to think if my parents had told us, you know, we're going on an extended vacation. <laughs> what oh, that kind of, would be right. What kind of confusion would that have caused in my mind versus, you know, my dad was like, we are leaving our country. We are going to a place where I feel I can do a better job providing opportunities for you. And that was like, okay, kids, it's going to be hard. There's going to be days where, you know, you guys are going to be the adults because you're going to speak the language faster than I am. Like stuff like that. He just prepared us mentally and emotionally and gave us the chance to rise to the occasion. Now, I'm not saying it's not hard for children that don't hear this. I just think, like, to your point, it sounds a little confusing. And then what happens when they go to school and, you know, <laughs> little Jenny has to tell Bobby in school, like, you know, in first grade, my parents are um, consciously uncoupling. And I don't think they can say it. We can't say we it. We can't <laughs> say it. How are they going to say it? So what? It, then I was thinking to myself, you know, it's a lot of the same of what we see in our society that currently where it's like a huge transition and shift and everything culture wise is happening. And, you know, it's like the pendulum is swinging so strong right now, right to left before it finds its center. I like the idea of conscience uncoupling as a perspective of a movement of how to think about divorce. Mm -hmm. I don't like it as a band-aid to put on top of the divorce to not say the word divorce. Like everything that um, Dr. Sadevi and Dr. Sami have written about it as far as changing the perspective of how we think of ever after and how we think about what should we should expect out of a marriage and not considering ourselves a, a failure and all those things. I, I, for all those reasons, I, I love it. I even love the idea of, a husband and wife who their marriage comes to an end and they don't want to use the divorce word necessarily to lose the integrity of those great years they had together, right? I, I can completely understand all of that. And it's actually interesting because you and I were completely in line with our mission for happily ever after divorce with everything they're saying. I don't like it when the pendulum swings so far away from sort of bringing an awareness to something to all of a sudden changing everything, the name of it and enforcing that. And then now the rest of us, including children, cannot say the D word because that was like so 1990s. And then now we have to be with the 2020s, <laughs> you know, the divorce can't even be said anymore. And I, and I think that's sort of a symptom of everything else we're facing, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I think that there is a lot of we take it too far, right? And and we push it too too far to the other side. But I like the analogy of the pendulum death swing. And hopefully we do kind of land in the middle where we are aware of, of the continuing of the relationship. And if they have children, it's a co-parenting relationship, right? Even if the children are grown. Right. Because you still have graduations and grandchildren and negotiating where the kids are going to go for holidays and what's going to happen. If you are, you know, a mature person, you are going to be in this co-parenting relationship for as long as you have children. Yeah. And I think that continuing that relationship and we do have a lot of people who have really long term marriages who are like, OK, wow, at this stage, we have decided after 30 years, after 40 years, we're going to live our rest of our lives apart. And it, I think sometimes they struggle yeah. with, with saying divorce. But, and you've probably seen this too, when people come into our office for the first time and they say that word for the first time, it actually can be empowering because they're like, 
all right, I've I've now chosen to be happy. Yeah. You know, I've made that choice and and the divorce is how I get there. That's and it's exactly what I have seen in so many. It's that the struggle sits in making a decision. Yeah. Once a decision's been made and the word has been spoken, just like you described, it's almost like, whoa, I jumped off a cliff and I found my wings. Yes. And they and but you had to make a decision for those wings to show up. You before you made a decision, the wings weren't going to show up. Yeah, it's that leap of faith. Right. Yeah. Right. And grabbing onto what you believe is going to be happy and often really is. Well, if you want to learn more about conscious uncoupling, you can go to goop, G-O-O-P dot com. I believe that's going to have Paltrow's website. Thanks for listening to the Happily Ever After Divorce Podcast. If you'd like to learn more, go to atlantadivorcelawgroup.com forward slash resources. 